Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. We'll see who shows up about 11.45 today, <laughs> which is, of course, a possibility. But it is good to, to be here on this snowy March Sunday as we worship our Lord and Savior and as we experience the warmth of the fellowship of uh, fellow believers, it's good to be here in worship. So I want to welcome you and invite you to stand as you're able. And we'll join together in this morning's call to worship, which is printed on the front of your bulletin, or you can follow along on the screen. Drink the living waters. Taste the bread of life. Come to the well of wisdom. Come, let us worship in spirit and truth. I'd like to invite you to remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, number 103, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. pray. Living water, flow through our worship this day. Quench our thirst for your wisdom and truth, that we may grow in faith and love. Fill us with streams of your spirit, that we may know you more fully. Amen. The Lord be with you. If you would exchange signs of God's peace.
Thank you, Mrs. Click, and uh, thank you, kids, for that. It uh, certainly brings an element of joy to our worship service whenever we have the, the children a part of that. While I'm beginning to make the announcements, I'm going to invite the, choir, uh, the bell choir. If you would come up and put your music down, because we're going to do a baptism here in a few minutes, and it would help me to do that so people in the center section can see. As we uh, do join together, I want to uh, say a word of welcome and uh, invite you, if you are at the end of the row, if you would sign the, the blue pads that are at the end of the row and pass those down, or you can go online at sigmarshcarmel.org slash attend. And in either case, it helps us to know that you're here, and also there's a place there if you have any pastoral needs or concerns you'd like to share, there's a place to do that uh, in, in either case. Today at 1.30, uh, Mrs. Click will be leading our uh, kids' music and praise group in a children's musical, Lenten musical, called The Name of Jesus. That'll be here in the sanctuary at 1.30, so uh, I want to invite you to come and support the children in their musical efforts and also uh, be blessed by the message and music that they share with us. Today at 2, we have a food pack, and I think uh, uh, we have uh, all the slots filled for volunteers, but if you'd like to donate to the food pack, you can still help uh, with the expenses of shipping and make a donation to the Midwest uh, Methodist Distribution Center. Today at 5, we'll continue our Lenten dinners and emphasis on our Breakthrough Prayer Initiative as we all uh, pray together our Breakthrough Prayer, which is in your bulletin this morning. It's the final prayer we'll be praying, but also a number of people are reading the book, The Dynamite Prayer, a 28-day experiment, and want to invite you to continue to pray the Breakthrough Prayer at 8 p.m. every Sunday or every evening with us. There are a number of other studies missions opportunities, and uh, other things in the bulletin, so I won't, I, I won't read all of those, but I do want to uh, encourage you to look at those and prayerfully consider how God might be calling you to be a part of the, the work and ministry here at St. Mark's. As always, these, these are all just ways that we continue to strive to live out our uh, intent and our aspiration to make St. Mark's be a place where mission is a way of life. One of the things that uh, I have to say that uh, is probably one of the most enjoyable parts of my job is blessing babies. And this morning we have an infant uh, baptism. So as the family comes forward, um, I just want to say a word about this family uh, in particular. Uh, they moved here from California at the very beginning of COVID, I think. and. Um, so Caitlin and Mike, they began to uh, watch our church online. Caitlin became a part of a number of Zoom uh, small group studies, but actually only began physically to come to the church probably about four, six weeks ago, maybe. Uh, and so uh, it, they've been a, a part of our community for a couple of years, but just have, we've, we've physically got to know them. And during COVID, uh, uh, they had a baby. Uh, <laughs> so, so uh, um, this is Miles, who we're going to baptize, and Miles has an older brother, Christopher, who's uh, in the children's uh, ministry uh, right now. Uh, we, the, probably the prudent thing to do, I guess, would be to, to say it was uh, that, that uh, Miles is there, or uh, Christopher is there. So we are excited today to, to join in uh, baptism with them and to uh, welcome Miles as a child of God into the world. And so at this time, I would like to invite you to turn to page 40 in your hymnal. If you'd like to follow along with me uh, as we do uh, the um, ritual of infant baptism. So I'm gonna ask the family now, on behalf of the whole church, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, I say I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say I do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races, if so say, I do. 
And now I ask you as parents, will you nurture Miles in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? If so, say, I will. Let us share in the thanksgiving over the water, which is in the following page. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Your children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of God's mercies each day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations, declare his work to the nations, his glory among all people. Pour out your spirit and bless this gift of water and he who receives it to wash away his sin and clothe him in righteousness throughout his life, that dying and being raised with Christ, he may share in Christ's final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. What name is given to this child? Miles Richard Kutak. Miles Richard, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit work within you that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> I got him a little bit wet there. So why don't we kind of let people see our newest uh, member of the faith here at St. Marcia Methodist Church. I always, I always remind the congregation that in baptism there are three, really three participants, the family who comes to offer this child, there is God who is always the primary participant in anything that we do at the church, and then there's also you, the congregation, as we promise to raise this child and be uh, supportive of him in his faith. So you, there is a congregational response in your bulletin, it'll be on the screen, if you would please join with me. With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround this person with a community of love and forgiveness that he may grow in his trust of God, be found faithful in his service to others. We will pray for him that he may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. I have a certificate here for you, but also uh, one of the ministries of the church is a prayer shawl ministry, and we, we uh, make prayer shawls and present them to our newest uh, baptized infants, and so we want to present one of those to you, and so uh, just congratulations and, and God bless. All right, you can have that, and you may return to your seat. Definitely worth getting up an hour early for, right? <laughs> the epistle lesson this morning is from Romans, fifth chapter, first through the eleventh verses. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hopes of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit and has been given to us. For while we were still weak, 
at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, surely anyone will die for a righteous person, although perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us, that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him, through the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of God for the peace of God.
Thank you, Casey and the bell choir. That's a very chromatic piece of music, which makes it very difficult for bells, and it's very beautiful. As we share a time of prayer today, uh, normally I invite you to a time of silence at the beginning of the prayers, and then I do a pastoral prayer in the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to do the pastoral prayer. There will be pauses during the prayer in which you can offer your silent prayers under various categories, so it would be a little bit different structure than uh, sometimes when we pray. But at this time, I would also like to remind us to pray for the Harris Jones family. Harris passed away on Friday, and his funeral will be here at the church this coming Friday at 11. So just uh, pray here for his family as they grieve. So let us be in prayer together. Saving God, you are the giver of living water, the source of deepest compassion, the fountain of eternal life. Therefore, we pray to you, wellspring of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are thirsty, thirsty for the life of meaning. those who are thirsty for a word of grace. Those who are thirsty for a drink of clean water. We also pray for all of those who are weary, weary from life's long journey. For those who are weary from quarreling and testing, for those who are weary from pain and grief. We pray for all who are broken, broken by sin and suffering. broken by hard disappointment. Broken by acts of violence. Loving God, through your spirit, pour your love into our hearts, your grace into our lives, your healing into our world, until the earth is filled with your glory as the waters cover the sea. Through Jesus Christ we pray, and together we pray the prayer that Christ taught his disciples and us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our mission focus for March is Family Promise of Greater Indianapolis, a nonprofit organization founded in 1994 in response to the crisis of families who are homeless. St. Mark's has been a longtime partner of Family Promise 
and continue to support families in the apartment shelter program, helping provide food and shelter. Additional services include the aftercare program and diversion program, which offer skill development and rehabilitation, working towards economic stability to, him, to end homelessness for the families they serve. Financial donations may be given using the, using the mission envelope in your bulletin or online at centmarscarmel.org slash give. <coughs> because you give, St. Mark's gives. Let us pray. God, our provider in Christ, you give us a spring of pure water that overflows to eternal life. Your love and hope fill our hearts so that we want to worship you in spirit and truth. Open our eyes to see the places in this neighborhood where our church's ministries could reach new people. Direct our gifts and offerings for your purposes so that our community will become like a field ripe for harvest. We ask this through Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. I'd like to invite you to remain standing for the gospel lesson, which comes from God, uh, John chapter 4. Last week we read the story of Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and this is sort of a companion story in a lot of ways, as we'll uh, point out. It is a rather long reading, so if you're weary and need to sit down, please feel free to do so. Uh, it begins in verse 5. So Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, and near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jesus, our Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and the flocks, his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. 
But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when we will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then the disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do not say, four months more, then comes the harvest. But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages, is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor." Many Samaritans came from that city, believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. This is the word of God for the people of God. You You may be seated. So this story of the woman at the well may be one of my favorite stories in the Gospels and one of many people's favorite stories. And it really has to be uh, read or at least discussed in companionship with the story that comes before us about Nicodemus. Because these are two stories that are meant to contrast each other in terms of how people receive Jesus. Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee and a teacher of the law, receives Jesus in the middle of the night when it's dark. And in John, the Gospel of John, dark and light are metaphors for uh, uh, people who accept Jesus or don't accept Jesus. So if you live in the darkness, you're not accepting the message light, you are. So Nicodemus comes in the darkness, he leaves in the darkness, and uh, this person that you kind of expect would get the message of Jesus Christ doesn't. But here is this uh, second story in which Jesus appears to this woman in, at noon, the, the brightest uh, time of the day, and they have a conversation. Now, some people have used the fact that the woman was at the well at noon as an indicator that maybe she was someone who wasn't well accepted in her village or well liked, because the normal practice would be to come and get your water uh, in the earlier hours of the morning when it's still cool before the heat of the day. Uh, But 
we may be reading too much into the text uh, at that level. There's no real indication of this woman's moral character other than uh, we'll talk a little bit later about some of the conversations she has with Jesus. She's there. She's uh, there to collect water, and Jesus arrives, and he speaks to her, and he says, give me a drink of water. How many of you have ever been in one of those circumstances where you're in a, a public place, you're not really wanting to have a conversation, but somebody comes up to you and begins to have a conversation? You ever have that happen? I could ask it this way. How many of you, if you're on an airplane, like to talk to the person next to you? And how many don't? Uh, I, I'm one of those, I'm, I've got earphones in, I'm, I'm reading my book, do you know what I mean? So uh, I'm not really there to make new friends, but occasionally you do. And it's kind of that circumstance here. Jesus is coming to the well. There's no indication that he's there for any other reason than to get food, but he has a conversation, unexpected conversation with this woman. He says, uh, can I have a drink of water? And uh, she says, you know, well, you don't have a bucket. The, the well is deep. And it, it is the launching pad for a conversation in which Jesus kind of changes the narrative for her, much like he did for Nicodemus. Remember last week with Nicodemus, Nicodemus came and said, how do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, you must be born again. And it began a conversation about being born and rebirthing. And, um, and as we talked about last week, Jesus was kind of talking at this level. Nicodemus was hearing and responding at this level. The same thing happens today, but there is a, 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 sh a sharp contrast between these two stories. So Jesus is talking at this level, and he says, uh, I, I have the living water. Now, in biblical times, the, the rubric was that if you were going to be baptized, you should be baptized in the living water. I have to, to say that when we do baptism, we don't follow that rubric. Because living water to them meant flowing water that moved like a river or an artesian well. Uh, uh, so, so water that was static, like in a bowl or in a cistern, would not be living water. And so Jesus says, I have, uh, I have a source of living water. And she says, well, this, this well is deep. It's, you know, and it's clearly she's responding in a different level. And finally he said, if you understood what I'm talking about in terms of living water, you would understand that I have a water that would quench your thirst and you would not be thirsty again. And she said, well, that's pretty extraordinary, but let me change the subject. So kind of like uh, Nicodemus did last week. And she says, uh, you know, you all worship in Jerusalem, but we worship here. So she tries to pick a fight with him, basically. Uh, uh, she, she introduces a controversial subject. Now, I have to say one of my rules of thumb with strangers in today's world is I avoid controversial subjects. I don't know about you. I'm not there to pick a fight with somebody if I'm having a, a first conversation. But she, she throws it out there and says, you, this, is, this is one of the primary differences between the Jews and the Samaritans as you worship in Jerusalem, we worship here. And, and Jesus won't take up that conversation. And he said, you know, he, gets, he comes back to the, the living water. And, and finally she says, well, I know that when the Messiah comes, he will set everything right. And Jesus says, I am the Christ, the Messiah. Now, that's an important thing. In the Gospel of John, there are a series of seven I am statements. And they are to bring to mind a time when Moses was at the burning bush. You remember Moses, God appeared to Moses at the burning bush. And at that time, uh, God calls Moses to go release the captive children of Israel in Egypt. And Moses says, who should I tell them sent me? And God says, tell them I am sent you. Now, a lot of people, uh, scholars believe you, that really should be translated, I am who I am. I am who I am sent you. And so when Jesus says, I am, and he says, I am the bread of life, I am the good shepherd, I am the, you know, in this case, I am the Messiah. Those are all, uh, people would immediately hear that word, I am, as, as the name of God, as, as him invoking uh, God as 
himself. And so there is this moment of revelation for this woman and moment of decision. And uh, the fact that they even had a conversation was difficult to fathom because uh, even today, if you go from Galilee to Jerusalem, if you go straight south, it's not the best route. You'd, most people will go a, a kind of a circuitous route around uh, rather than going straight to, for, to Jerusalem because if you go around uh, an arc, you can avoid what we call today the Occupied West Bank, which is uh, if you go straight, you have to go through the Occupied West Bank. The, the, what's the Occupied West Bank today would have been Samaria in Jesus' time, and, and the same principle applied. Most people would take the long route. Now, I don't know about you, but how many of you like to take shortcuts? Usually there's one in a couple that likes to do that. Uh, I'm not a shortcut person. I, I like to take, I, uh, Michelle will tell you that uh, I like to go with what I know. You know, I mean, I, I like to go the route, even if it's a little longer, I'd rather go a little longer for a, but Jesus took this shortcut through Samaria, which was extraordinary. And he's having this conversation with this woman and she says, uh, you know, she gets it. In contrast to Nicodemus in the middle of the night who was a teacher of law who didn't get it, this woman gets it. And so she says to herself, this person told me everything I, you know, about myself. He knows everything about me. And he goes, she goes into town. Now, I think it's ironic and sort of humorous that it says she left her water part, water jug and went back to town. So the whole reason she came was to fill her water jug, but she left it and she went back down and she told her friends, this person knows everything about me. Now, it's, it sounds like that could be a little juicy. She, when she and Jesus had a conversation, um, he, she, she evidently had five husbands. Now, people have read a lot into that, and maybe we shouldn't, because it was not uncommon in this time and place for mortality rates to be high. And it's very possible that she had five husbands because she survived each one of those husbands. As a matter of fact, uh, the Pharisees come at one time and, and ask Jesus a question about a woman who's married and then her husband dies and then she marries his brother, which is what the practice was. And then he dies and she marries another brother and so forth. And so it, it was not inconceivable that uh, that was part of the circumstance. So to read too much morality into that might, might be problematic. But <clears throat> suffice it to say, she had a complicated past. And Jesus knew everything about her. And she goes to her friends and says, this person knows everything about me. Now, I want to ask you, how many of you would be very happy for the person next, sitting next to you to know everything you've ever done or said? Yeah, some of you are, are, are not too keen. Some of you think, okay, you probably know everything you've done. So. But she says, he knows everything about me. But, the, but the, the thing that is implied that she doesn't say is, he knows everything about me and he accepts me anyway. You know, he knows everything about me and he accepts me anyway. That there is this this implied acceptance in that, in that scenario. So she tells her friends that. Meanwhile, for those of you who are Spin and Marty fans, meanwhile, back at the ranch, meanwhile, the disciples show up. And they, they say to themselves, but not to Jesus, why is he talking to a woman? Because that was a social taboo. To talk to a woman in public you don't know. And, but they don't say that to him. Instead they say, here we have food. And Jesus says, and which is the whole reason they left. And Jesus says, I'm not hungry anymore. And they said, did somebody feed him? And he says, no, I have food. So again, disciples talking here, Jesus talking here. There's a lot of disconnect in their conversation. And, and so Jesus talks about doing the work of God as, as food and uh, as sustenance uh, for them. And, and so they have that little conversation, parenthetical conversation. And then the woman and her friends come back and, and they believe Jesus. And one of the most surprising parts of the story is that it says, then Jesus stayed 
uh, they, the Samaritans invited him to stay with them, and he stayed two days with them. Now, if you traveled through Samaria and you were a Jew like Jesus and his disciples, you moved through Samaria as quickly as possible. For him to stay as their guest for two days really was astounding and would have been astounding to the readers of the Gospel of John at this time. And part of what most of us who are students of the Bible believe is that the, the writer of John and Jesus in this story is beginning to lay the groundwork for the expansion of the ministry of God's grace beyond the Jewish community. Is beginning to, to do what is more explicit in the book of Acts where Jesus says, uh, go to Israel, to Jerusalem, to Samaria, and to all the ends of the world. So the first step in those concentric circles is Samaria, which is illustrated in this story. And so he uh, begins to, to teach us and his disciples that the grace of God and is, is expanding and beginning to expand their understanding of what it means to share the message of Jesus Christ. So when we listen to the story, and it's a rich story, there's a lot of things that we could talk about in this. We have to ask ourselves, what are we meant to learn from this? What is Jesus trying to teach us about our own encounters with other people? And I think there are several things we could, uh, we could glean from this. One is Jesus had a conversation that was unexpected. And there are some times when we have opportunities to meet people, to interact with people, uh, that, that may be unexpected opportunities. And I know, because I, I know some of your stories and I know my own stories, that sometimes the richest experiences we've had with people are those unexpected experiences where someone that we didn't intend really to have a conversation with or a, a relationship with, somehow we are thrust together and God uses that to reveal something to us in powerful ways. And so we begin to understand that part of the message of this story is a message of courage and fortitude and acceptance as we reach out to people who are different than we are. Many of you know that one of my favorite preachers is Fred Craddock, who used to uh, teach preaching at Candler School of Theology at Emory University in Atlanta. And Fred Craddock tells a story. His, his wife was out of town, and Fred was part of a generation where uh, a, a guy who didn't cook, you know, his wife did all of the cooking. So he was in a little bit of a panic because his wife was leaving town, and he's like, how am I, you know, how am I going to keep myself from starving while she's gone? And so he decided, you know, I can make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich because that's something I can make. But he goes to the cupboard, and there's no peanut butter. So he decides to go to the store and get some peanut butter. Uh, unfortunately, though, he's not a shopper either, so you're seeing a trend here. And he gets to the store, and he doesn't know where the peanut butter is, and he says it's a huge store. So he sees a, a woman there who looks like she knows her way around the grocery store, and he says to her, ma'am, could you tell me where the peanut butter is? And she just goes, huh, and, and carts off. And he's like, okay. And so he finally finds a store employee and asked them, and they said, you know, aisle 15B, whatever, and so he goes to the peanut butter aisle, and, and he looks at the peanut butter, and there's about 1,500 choices of peanut butter, so he's trying to decide what peanut butter to buy, and he's, he's standing there and contemplating the varieties of peanut butter, when this woman with her cart comes around the aisle, and she looks at him, and she said, huh, you were looking for peanut butter. And he said, of course I was looking for a peanut butter. And, and she said, well, I thought maybe you were trying to hit on me. And he said, no, I was just trying to buy some peanut butter. And she said, well, you can't be too careful. And he said, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Sometimes maybe we think in our lives, in our world, you can't be too careful. But thankfully, Jesus wasn't too careful in this story. And there are times in our lives where maybe we can be too careful when we can exclude uh, other people just uh, because we are too cautious. And maybe we listen to that voice that says, no, you know, be, be careful. Jesus went through Samaria. He encountered this woman 
He broke social taboos in order to share the good news of God's living water and in our lives. Maybe that's a message we need to hear. It's that we need to know that some of the people we encounter this week, some of the unexpected people, some of the people that maybe look a little different or act a little different than we act or look, may be the people that God wants us to share a word of grace, a word of love, a word of acceptance with as we try to live out our faith in Jesus Christ. Let us follow this example of Jesus. Let us share the living water that God has shared with us. Let us pray. Almighty and holy God, sometimes we are too careful. You call us to open, uh, expand our borders, to see people in a new way, to discuss the love of grace and peace of Christ, to share the living water. So we pray, O oh God, that you might just uh, give us eyes to see and ears to hear, expand our mission field, that we may see the light of your presence and share that light with others. In Christ's name, amen. I want to invite you to stand as you're able as we sing our closing hymn, The Spirit Song, which reminds us of God's Spirit being poured out upon us and uh, as we care for others. Sunday during Lent, we'll close this morning's worship with our breakthrough prayer. So would you please pray with me? God, please break through and open doors to new hopes, dreams, and possibilities for our church and our lives. We surrender and faithfully follow Christ to your new and unknown future. May your will be done. Amen.